All right. Hello, hello. I think we are going. So today, today, in this lecture, I'm going to try to refine William James's theory of meaning by looking at the work of Theodore and Grace de Laguna. Not super well known, unfortunately, they are two, but they are two of my favorites, especially Grace, Grace de Laguna. I think she's one of the, really one of the great American philosophers. Um, I wish she was better known so that I could talk to other people about her, but <laughs> I just think she's great. So we'll... Um, and yeah, I don't, I haven't talked about her much before just for various reasons. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, we'll be talking about them today, a husband and wife, the De Lagunas. Um, they were important individually. So we're, I'm going to talk about uh, a book they wrote together when they were still fairly young. Um, but they were important on their own, on their own terms, in their own careers. Um, they were important philosophers and philosophy professors. Their children were also important. At the end of my um, lecture on William James, I showed a picture of the, the whole family. I just cut out Grace and Theodore here. But their children are actually also important. Their daughter was an important anthropologist, uh, Frederic, I think, Frederica, Frederic, I forget. Um, I think Frederica de Laguna. And their son, uh, I've forgotten his name though. Well, any, in any case, their son was something like a uh, nuclear scientist. I'm not exactly sure, um, but you can find bits of information about him also if you search but there's lots about um, Theodore and Grace and Frederica you know if you're interested in that kind of thing um, so Theodore and Gro uh, Grace wrote a book called Dogmatism and Evolution let me show you at first where we are in our so we're jumping ahead a little bit chronologically in terms of birth dates um, because they are commenting on the work of William James, especially. Uh, so yeah, this is going to be kind of a commentary on William James in part, or uh, building, I guess, on his terms, I would say. And they wrote together this book here called Dogmatism and Evolution. It's a, I think it's an important book. It's an interesting book. It's an important book because it's really one of the early extended marriages, marryings of philosophy and Darwinism. So a lot of people had been influenced by Darwin, but this is a really explicit and I think a very thorough um, marriage of Darwinism and philosophy, and that's characteristic of all their work. So dogmatism and the dogmatism part is that they're discuss discussing and critiquing what they call dogmatic philosophies, which at this time people tended to, tended to divide philosophy into rationalism and empiricism. I'm not going to get into the details of that now. <clears throat> but they called these dogmatic philosophies. They're basically, um, you know, they're built on these assertions of the way things are. But they're not taking into account, for example, change. And this was a big, we'll see this also in other philosophers around this time, especially the pragmatists or people kind of in the, the circle of pragmatism, kind of next to it, in it, whatever, um, that they're really interested in the idea of time and change and adaptation and so they're interested in that, in philosophy, in, uh, as e in an evolutionary philosophy, a philosophy that takes into account 
change and growth and development, evolution, things like that. Whereas dogmatic philosophies don't. You're kind of stuck in time, kind of in a Newtonian uh, timeless state where this is uh, understood to be always true, always the case. Or, you know, the, the assertions you make are understood to be kind of timeless axioms. Uh, let's see. So I want to mention uh, yeah, just a couple of things. So just building on the evolutionary thing, they would go on. So they were, as I mentioned, important individually. Laguna would later, uh, Theodore de Laguna would later write the, a book called The Factors of Social Evolution, which is interesting, uh, an interesting book obviously based in evolution, but talking about social evolution as opposed to biological evolution. And uh, Grace de Laguna would write one of, uh, same time about, would write one of my all-time favorite books called Speech, Its Function and Development, which is an evolutionary account of language. Possibly the first, not exactly the first evolutionary account of language, but I think the first real, I would call it the first real evolutionary account, the first really serious evolutionary account of language. Um, they were a lot of, in a lot of ways, they're closer to Dewey. Dewey was also writing a lot, writing a lot about evolutionary philosophy, uh, about evolution, sorry, I should say. Dewey was writing a lot about evolution around this time also, around ethics, his uh, theory of ethics is very evolutionary, for example, um, and his kind of his logic, as he called it. Um, so they're close to Dewey, they're close to another philosopher slightly earlier than them named Edward A. Singer Jr., who I've talked about occasionally. Uh, their theory of meaning, however, I find to be closer to Peirce, a little bit closer to Peirce in an interesting way. They seem not to have been very directly influenced by Peirce. Peirce was not, uh, he was known, but not very many of his writings were available at this time. So I don't think they, they it does not seem like they were that influenced by Peirce. But definitely Dewey, I would say was a big influence. I'll talk about Dewey uh, fairly soon in a, a upcoming lecture, upcoming talk. Uh, so Grace and Theodore, the De Laguna, I'm going to call them the De Lagunas, I guess. I don't know a good way to, uh, maybe Grace and Theodore, <laughs> except I don't, uh, not really on personal terms with them. But the De Lagunas um, were not I don't think they really called themselves pragmatists. They liked pragmatism. Um, you know, they thought of it as an evolutionary philosophy, maybe imperfect. Um, they're criticizing it in part. And you have to remember a little bit that in the early 20th century, pragmatism had, well, the meaning was not very settled. So a lot of people who we think of as pragmatists did not consistently call themselves pragmatists. They had o their own names for their philosophy. Dewey is a good example. We think of him as a pragmatist, but he often called himself his, or called his philosophy other things. And I think uh, Grace and Theodore, the De, La, uh, De Laguna, are similar to that. They're basically in the world of pragmatism, but they don't really call themselves pragmatists. Grace would call her theory of language, basically called it behavioristic in uh, speech, in her book Speech. Um, it's basically a behavioristic evolutionary theory of language. And Edgar A. Singer Jr. had a, he was kind of a behaviorist. He didn't really call himself a behaviorist, but he talked a lot about behavior and some people call him a behaviorist. Um, and he also was kind of one of these people, like kind of we might, we probably would think of him as a pragmatist now, but he did not really call himself a pragmatist either. Um, so it's hard to know what to what to call them. I would just say evolutionary. That was the the consistent thread in all their work is that it's really based in evolution in thinking about things evolutionarily. So in dogmatism and evolution, they are. 
critiquing James's theory of meaning, they're proposing their own evolutionary theory of meaning, as opposed to, and other things as well, they're doing other things. Um, critiquing dogmatic philosophy, of course, rationalism and traditional empiricism, but we're focusing, of course, on meaning. So, uh, yeah, if you have a chance, I would recommend reading their Dogmatism and Evolution, Part 3, which is where they're giving their constructive theory, really. The first parts of the book are more critique. They're also critiquing pragmatism in Part 3, but also kind of adding to it or trying to fix what they don't like about it. So a really interesting book from 1910. This was the, the same the same year that William James's last book was published. They were just starting out at that time, um, pretty young. What was their birth dates again? 1876, 1878. So yeah, they were, uh, they were just young, young folks, 30 or so years old, right? Yeah, 30 something, young 30s. Um, so yeah, it's an impressive book for a couple of uh, philosophers just starting out. And it's unfortunately kind of forgotten. Yeah, so I want to go through their, well, just touch on their critique of William James's pragmatism. They had not, of course, read his later work uh, um, that I had talked about in my lecture, um, Some Problems of Philosophy, since that, of course, came out the same year. They're not going to, they hadn't uh, read it, I would assume. But they're reading his uh, influential book, Pragmatism, they're talking about his book, Pragmatism, which was published in 1907. Uh, a couple of their critiques. So they're criticizing that he neglects what they call the genetic aspect of concepts. So they're looking at his theory of percepts and concepts as it stood in Pragmatism, which I think is not quite as developed as in some problems of philosophy. But anyway, they um, are uh, displeased that he neglects what they call the genetic aspect. This is a, a word that was used a lot at this time to mean something very different than what we mean today when they're talking about the genetic aspect of something. They're talking about the uh, origin and development, basically. So you could think of it as the evolution, but we're not talking about the evolution of an organism, like the genetic genetic evolution of an organism. We're talking about the evolution of a capacity or some kind of behavior, something like that. And so, uh, as I pointed out in his uh, last work, James does address this a little bit, uh, actually just in like a, a few paragraphs. Um, so even in his later work, he do, uh, his last work, he does neglect it a bit, I think, but he does point to some interesting insights. Um, he neglects, James neglects the content. That was also a, a complaint I had in my lecture on James. He doesn't say very much about the content of concepts. And so they are trying to revise, improve on James in this uh, part three of their dogmatism and evolution. So I want to talk about their theory of meaning. It uses some similar words as James does, but it's uh, there's some really major differences. These are the key terms in the De Laguna's theory of meaning, just as for convenience, I'm going to call it. So uh, the word object, so object, concept, percept, and idea. These are the main, the key words, object, concept, percept, idea. You can see these are similar words, uh, similar or same words that James has used. And then concepts, there's going uh, to be simple concepts, general concepts. And then concepts have two aspects, two different aspects, content and import. So I'm going to start talking about simple concepts or simple object concepts and then we'll go uh, talk about general concepts. So concepts are the things that have meaning. But I want to uh, talk about what they say about object. 
And I think I have the longer quotation on my slide. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about simple concepts and general concepts. So first, um, they'll mention the object. So the object is, you know, we'd normally think about the object is what the concept refers to. That's the normal uh, language here. This is a longish quotation, but it's an important one. It's kind of a summary of um, at least part of their theory. So let's read through this. The object as such is only a conditional determinant of any specific reaction, just as it is only a conditional determinant of any specific sensations. So these are two other important this, uh, another important distinction, kind of two important other words that you'll need to pay attention to is reaction and sensation. Basically behavior and then what you kind of perceptually experience through your senses. So they're saying that the object is a conditional determinant. So it's one factor in determining a reaction or a sensation. And then they continue uh, down here, and it, it, and it is the nature of the conditions under which an object may determine sensation on the one hand and reaction on the other, that is relations to other objects, which constitutes uh, in a large measure our conception of it. So it's the nature of the conditions under which some object determines how we perceive how we act. So it's the conditions that uh, in a large measure make up our concept of it. So under what conditions will this object make me have this kind of experience or this kind of reaction? That's our at least a large measure of our conception of it. And then uh, at, at the end there, what does determine contact, conduct in any case is the total situation. So what actually determines conduct is not the object per se, but the object in a total situation uh, or the total situation itself with the object as a part of it. The relation of the object to the situation is that of a factor recognized as a possible factor in other situations. So an object as an object is a, um, you know, for us, when you see an object, you recognize that it can exist in many different contexts that you're in. It's not just a factor of, generally, it's not just a um, factor of one situation. It's something that you're, you know, if you have a concept of it, it's something that you're expecting to, that you've seen before and are expecting to see again, probably, um, or might see again. Uh, let's see. So the, yeah, so the object, something out there in the world that partly determines our sensations and behaviors. But it's the object's place in the total situation that fully determines how we perceive and respond to that object. So the simple object concept, so the simple, sometimes I just call it the simple concept, but let's say the concept of a simple object is I think their usual phrase. Our concept of, um, of the object is something like our learned expectations, our expectations or our knowledge that we get through experience regarding the object's, object's potential for determining sen sensation and reaction under particular conditions. Uh, so the object... Um, yeah, I don't know how you would, uh, how they think of the object, if they think of the object um, in itself, if there is a way, if they, um, uh, anyway, I'm uh, reminded a little bit of the Kantian thing in itself. So the object, we don't really perceive like the thing in itself, right? You don't really perceive the Kantian thing in yourself. It's a kind of a potential for determining, right? The object itself is kind of a potential for determining sensation and reaction. And the conditions that it appears in are gonna actually determine 
your sensation and reaction. So depending on you know, all kinds of things, right? Lighting, temperature, mood, all kinds of things are going to determine how you determine how you actually perceive some object in the world. Yeah, so we don't maybe directly perceive the object, but you have a concept, you build up a concept of the object, right? Of the things that you perceive. You build up concepts of them. And depending on the situation, so that depending on the situation, the concept is represented as a percept or idea. So this is where we get percept and idea. So they're not making a division between percepts and concepts as James did. So kind of everything is concepts for the De Lagunas. I think in semiotics we'd say like everything is signs, but everything is concepts and then the concepts appear to us as either percepts or as ideas. So this is a, an important distinction which is not on my slide I guess. Um, I'll come back to that later, actually. I think that's on a different slide. Um, yeah, so I'll explain. I'll explain percept and idea more later. So when you actually know, when you know what an object is, when you have knowledge, when you have knowledge of an object, you know how it's likely to appear under various conditions and what you'd be able to do with it under various conditions. Um, so, for example, when you see your favorite uh, coffee mug or when you see your water bottle, you have certain expectations about how it, how it will appear and what you're going to be able to do with it, what you can do with it. You distinguish it from the table that it's on. You distinguish it from other objects that are around. And... Yeah, the total situation is going to de determine the details of that aspects. So that, yeah, that, uh, the total situation, again, could include like the time of day. So you're going to understand, you're going to know, you're going to experience your coffee mug differently in different times of the day, different moods that you have. Uh, if you're thirsty or not, how thirsty you are, what you're trying to do at the moment, like it might be in the way. At some moment, you might be looking for it specifically at another moment, uh, and so on. Yeah, so I want to get to uh, the two aspects of the concept, content and the import. And I don't know if they're totally explicit about this, but the content, I believe, is about how it determines sensation. And import is on this on the side of reaction. So import is like function for James. Content, I think, is the kind of the same. Um, uh, in William James, the content is a little bit ill-defined, not quite well-defined. But import is very similar to function in James, the function of uh, concepts. And content, I think, is about how you uh, see it, experience it sense, uh, in your se through your senses. So concepts of simple objects have two aspects, content and import. Um, yeah, another way I would, yeah, so sensation, reaction, I would also say perception and action is maybe a more modern way, uh, well, that comes, comes from around the same period in time, the perception action cycle and stuff. <clears throat> but you might relate it to that idea in psychology of perception of the perception action cycle. Um, the content of the object is yeah the content of the concept uh, of a simple object. So we're talking about the concept of a simple object. The content is made up, they say, made up on the one hand of distinctions between the object and the situation and of its quasi-logical connections with other objects from which it must be discriminated. So they've got this term quasi-logical. I'll uh, come to that in a moment. But the content of the object, again, is distinctions between objects, between objects and situations. Um, 
the distinction of the object from other objects is correlated, they tell us, with the identity of the object's object in different situations. So we distinguish objects from other objects. We also identify objects over time. And that's part of content that we're talking, still talking about content. So if you're uh, thinking about your water bottle, I have my water bottle here. Um, it's distinguished from and related to maybe your uh, coffee cup, let's say if you have your, I don't have my coffee cup here, but uh, so if you have a water bottle and a coffee cup, they are related in some way, we'd say a quasi-logical way. Um, again, I'll explain that. And they are recognized to persist over time in different situations. So your cup persists, it's not just there for an instant, it is the same thing, you identify it as the same thing over time in different contexts. Um, and the way I kind of think about this is with perse purse, purses, not percept, purses, Charles purses, CS purses, uh, concepts of icon and index here. So icon, something that looks similar to another thing when a sign looks similar to its object. But I'm thinking here of the similarity of how objects look. So there might be a similarity between your water bottle and your coffee cup. They have a similar function too, but they're, uh, what you call that, cylindrical. They're cylinders basically with open tops. You can put liquid in, they might hold liquid, even the same kind of liquid. So they have certain uh, perceptual similarities, uh, but also clear differences. You're not gonna usually mix them up, but you might say that there's a certain iconicity, a certain similarity, similarity of appearance there. Um, on the other hand, if you think of your, at least for me, like my water bottle and my phone, right? They don't look at all similar, but they are often together because those are two things that are important for me to just have with me because uh, I'm often thirsty, especially in the summer in Taipei. And of course, it's just part of life now to always have your phone with you. And index, things are correlated in experience, right? So that's another way to think about sort of the quasi-logical connection of objects. It's not logical. Logical is something a bit different. But this iconic or indexical connection, so similarity in appearance or difference in appearance between objects and kind of relation in your experience. So always having certain objects with you, they might be have a kind of relation for you in that way. Like I always bring my water bottle and my phone and my wallet, I guess if I'm going out. Um, so those things are kind of tied together, although they look very different. Um, so yeah, so different kinds of connections that objects can have, which are not really logical. We'll come to what logical means, at least for them in, uh, um, in a moment. Yeah, so situation matters for thinking about the content as well. So we probably never see an object in the same way twice, of course. You never really see the same thing twice. You never see the same thing in the same way twice. You know, they're always looking different angles, different light quality, different moods, different, you know, you're older <laughs> all the time. So each time you see something, you're older than you were when you last saw it. So you've changed. Uh, yeah, so the situation matters in which you see an object. Uh, import, import. So talking about function, as Jim, uh, Jim James, James called it the function. Uh, implications for conduct, reaction, action, behavior. An object presents us with a range of mostly learned behavioral possibilities. So objects, we can do certain things with them. Not anything, but certain things, a range of things we can do. Uh, depend and de that depends also on the situation. And so this makes up the import of the concept. What we can do with that in a certain situation. So for to go back to the example of my coffee mug, my coffee mug sitting on my desk filled with coffee calls out to be used differently 
than my coffee mug sitting in the sink waiting to be washed. So the same object, right? The same object of experience, of perception or sensation, but depending on where it's encountered, it's going to call out maybe for different reactions. So that's the part of the um, the uh, import of the concept, which again is what James calls the function, just to confuse things. Uh, and then, so percept versus idea. Percept and idea are two ways of representing the concept, basically. Percept, um, well, so the, the background to this is that you never can be conscious of the whole concept. At least maybe there's a few minor cases where you can be conscious of a whole concept, but generally not because there's, there's just too much information there. There's too many ways an object could appear. There's too many different things you could do in it in too many different situations. So you never have a whole concept in your consciousness. Um, when I see or think of my coffee mug, right, see it, see it, or when I think of it later, uh, you never consider all the possible ways that it might appear or be used. You get a rough, kind of a rough idea of how it looks or how uh, you want to use it at a particular moment. And yeah, you can't keep all of the, all of the possible various ways of using something or seeing something in your mind at one time. So the concept in kind of actual experience is represented as a percept or as an idea. The difference here is basically if it's determined by an external source or internal source. So percepts, you're actually seeing like an actual object, like my actual water bottle. This is a percept, right? I'm seeing it through my external sense organs. But if I'm not looking at it, I can still see it in some sense in my, we say in my mind, I'm just going to use that word for convenience here without getting into what mind is. But you can see the, see it in your mind when you're not thinking about it or when you're not seeing it. And that's determined by kind of my internal sources, like what I, other things I might be thinking about and so on. Uh, or s I might see something that reminds me of it and I might start thinking about it, but that's kind of an, an, an internal process. Um, so yeah, they would call that, they call that an idea. So the concept is this large system of associations and uses and possibilities, possibilities for sensation that we can never really experience all at once. Instead, what we experience are percepts or ideas. And maybe you can think of these as tokens of the ideal concept. So the concept, the concept of the concept is kind of an ideal, right? It's an ideal thing. Um, but what we really deal with are tokens of that concept, which are either going to be percepts or ideas, depending on if we're actually looking at a, a thing or not. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, James has kind of a similar... Well, his distinction between percept and concept is actually more like this, right? Percepts are like things that we see, and then his concepts are thoughts, which they are calling ideas. So there's some, uh, some different terms going on here, which might be confusing. Yeah, so when the object is perceived as part of the external environment with its own content and import, it is a percept. When it is perceived in the mind's eye, so to speak, it's an idea. Uh, they describe the idea as maybe something like the faintest image of a word or other symbol, perhaps peculiar to the individual. Um, we'll come back to this idea later when we talk about Titchener, at least, maybe other people. Um, around this symbol, this idea, associations cluster, they say, determined by habit, by interest, other features of the situation. Yeah, so our interests, our needs, the situations we're in are going to give our ideas different associations. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, well, control of behavior by ideas. Okay, so control of behavior. So I have an example of this again about my coffee mug. If, I, if you have or if I have the habit of drinking coffee after I wake up, then I might, you know, when I wake up, I might get a flash of uh, the word coffee or the word mug or a flash of the image of a mug or something, a flash of coffee, a picture of coffee in a mug or something. And then I'll go and search for my coffee mug or make coffee, or whatever. So it's control of behavior by ideas, at least in some sense, like because of our habits, you know, when you wake up, uh, uh, coffee, and then you, you have the idea of coffee and you go and uh, go through the behaviors of getting coffee. Okay, so summary, yeah, summary of simple concepts, concepts of simple objects. Uh, through experience, we build up expectations about the possible sensations and possibilities for, possibilities for actions provided by objects. So we're building up uh, expectations about what we might see, what we might do when given certain objects. These possibilities form our concepts of the objects, their content and import, what James called function. Uh, yeah, so these, these possibilities are their, their content and import. In any particular situation, the concept of the object is represented by a percept or an idea, depending on whether we're actually um, responding to the object in the external environment or whether we're just thinking about it, right? So that's the distinction between percept and idea. Okay, so I want to go on to general concepts, general concepts. And here maybe they're talking about language. I'm not sure if they're explicit about that. Of course, Grace de Laguna would write a whole book about language later on, um, which is worth looking at. Uh, but I don't think she uh, meaning is a big, well, she talks a lot about the function of language and that is meaning according to some definitions, but I don't think she uses meaning as a very important uh, term in that book. So a general concept, co general concepts are derived from the common significance for conduct of a variety of objects. So again, very functional, functionally oriented, right? formed from the similar imports, I would say, using their language also, of a variety of objects. So it's more about the import than about the content. And why is that? Well, we'll see. Um, yeah, so a general concept, not, you might think of it as a class of simple concepts. I'm not sure if that's quite right, but I'll throw that out there. So I have an, I'll give you an example. So let's take the word, we'll take the word toy as an example. This is uh, a general concept, a general concept of toy. Uh, so the content, right, content is kind of like the appearance of something. It's possibilities for sensation. Content or appearance can play a role too in determining general concepts, I think, but for taking the general concept of toy. Uh, we don't get this concept because all toys look similar in some way. There's not something about all toys that appears to us as similar. It's a functional similarity, right? The similarity is what you can do with the objects to which the concept is applied. So when something becomes a toy, is labeled as a toy, that's a functional designation, a functional labeling. It's not about how something looks. <clears throat> yeah, so for example, these could both be toys. Right? My son has toys that look like stuff, has teddy bear-like toys, stuffed animal toys, and he has just some pots and stuff that we bought. Those can be toys too. So any of those things can be toys. They don't look at all alike, but it's a there's something functional. So what let's maybe go more deeply into this. So what is a toy? You know, what do you think a toy is? Well, 
what I might say. This is not really from the De Lagunas. This is my own kind of uh, way to think about it or illustrate their theory. So children learn that they have uh, control over certain objects. They have kind of a sovereign control over certain objects. Not everything in their household. You know, they don't have control over everything, but there are certain things that are theirs to control. They can do kind of what they want with. So let's say a teddy bear and an old pot. These are my examples that the family doesn't want or use anymore. So just some old pot and then they don't need it. So they gave it to the to the child to play with. So they don't look very similar. The child may not use them in a very similar way either. So you don't necessarily do the same thing with a teddy bear that you do with an old pot. But there is a certain freedom of use that the child has that she doesn't have with non-toy objects, with other objects, right? So no one's going to restrain the child if she drops the teddy bear off the bed or puts uh, or puts rocks in the old pot or whatever. But if she, for example, drops the family pet off the bed or puts rocks in their nice new pot, then something different is going to happen. The family's going to try to stop her or punish her or whatever. So there's a difference between toy objects and non-toy objects in some functional way, right? The child gets to do have more freedom of use with toy objects, less with non-toy objects. So this is one example of I, what I would call a general concept. The child learns that there is a class of objects over which she has personal control and which she can use in a variety of ways. The objects in this class now have a logical, I think this is more of a uh, technically a logical relation or what I think Peirce would call a symbolic relation. So the Lagunas say that general concepts have logical relations. Peirce, I think, would mean the same thing with the term symbolic when he talks about symbols. So that's why I said, right, in ter uh, Peirce, objects, uh, signs and objects can be related in different ways, icons, indices, and symbols. And I associate kind of iconic or indexical relations with quasi-logical relations and symbolic relations with logical relations. That's my thinking here. But um, again, the Lagunas don't really write about purse. So toys is a, a logical class. So the, there's a logical class of toys that objects can move into, not because they are inherently similar or causally connected in some way to other objects in the class, but by convention. So general concepts, at least often, I don't maybe always, probably I, always I would say, are uh, conventional categories of stuff, right? Because we're probably really talking about language here with general concepts. I don't think they say that explicitly but I think we're talking about language here with general concepts. And that is a matter of convention, at least so far as we're concerned here. Right, so to something becomes a toy as a matter of convention. It's not inherently a toy, although a lot of things nowadays are made to be toys. But that's still a matter of, you know, we're making this to be a toy. It's a convention. But in the case of the pot, for example, the family might say, we don't need this old pot. We've got a nice new pot. We don't need this old one that doesn't function very well anymore. So why don't we just give it to the kid? You know, do you want this for a toy? And most kids are not too, um, are just happy to play with random stuff, at least when they're young. And uh, yeah, they're happy to have objects, I think, that they can control and experiment with and do whatever. And so the pot becomes a toy, not because it's inherently a toy, of course. It's, I don't know if it's inherently anything, but by convention, it can become a toy. And so it takes on that general, becomes part of that general class of things. And then um, in a kind of related way, the general concept toy 
becomes logically distinguished from other general concepts. So there's um, a logical connection between objects in the category toy, and then there's a logical relation between uh, the class toy or the category toy and other categories like kitchenware or clothing or you know exercise equipment, um, pets, siblings, and so on. Uh, and general concepts, let's see what I have here. Oh yeah, so logical relations, matter of convention. And then the last thing, uh, general concepts are important because they allow us improved behavioral control. They write, uh, so general concepts are important because they make behavioral control easier and more far-reaching. So at a certain, certain stage in a child's development, you can tell them, well, when they're young, you have to be very specific, right? So you're telling them, like, if you want them to get dressed, you need to be like, all right, put on these underwear, put on this shirt, now put on your pants, whatever, now put your socks, now your shoes. Um, but when they get older, you can just say, get dressed, go get dressed. And that's, um, you know, much more general. So you're not talking about specific objects. You're saying do some specific category or do some general category of behavior. And you're not so concerned, at least on a, um, at least in many cases, you're not concerned with whether they wear this shirt or that shirt, so long as they put on clothes. Um, but you can also, of course, be more specific. Go put on nice clothes. Go put on your play clothes. These are still general state, general using general concepts, um, but allowing behavioral control in still a kind of specific way, or a, f uh, a more far-reaching way. Right? You don't need to be there telling them do this, do this, do this, do this. You just say, get dressed. Uh, and there's uh, appropriate and inappropriate ways to fill uh, to fulfill those instructions that we learn growing up. Okay, so going on to the conclusion for this, yeah, I uh, I do think the Lagunas made some important advances over James, over William James's theory of percepts and concepts, his theory of meaning. It's unfortunate that uh, they seem not to have had Peirce's writings available to them. Again, this was 1910. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff that Peirce wrote only became available uh, after he died. So I'm curious how they would have responded to Peirce's theory of meaning, which is more specific uh, and detailed than James's theory, but also you would call it uh, pragmatist, right? So I do uh, appreciate that they fill out the notion of content more. So again, it's a, a pretty big difference from James. What they're calling content is more like what he would call the um, percept. Uh, well, yeah, there's a difference there too. <laughs> um, yeah, so they fill out the notion of content, right? The possibility of an object for affecting your senses, for, how, for what you might perceive. But how you actually perceive it will depend on situations, and that will be the percept. Um, so they give this, they're more, much more precise about the notion of content than James was. Yeah, and perceptual relations or quasi-logical relations between objects and between objects and situations, right? All that's part of the, the content. And they clarify the distinction between simple and general concepts or particular concepts and general concepts so specific objects that we interact with as compared to categories of object specific a specific teddy bear teddy bear versus um, the category of toy that teddy bear might belong to as an act of convention um, yeah so, so i think james tends not to be very clear about this he maybe combines them, lumps them together, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, another important important difference is about the percept. I tried to make this pretty clear, but the percept for James was basically the object, right? The thing 
the thing you see or experience or hear, whatever. Um, while the concept was our thought or idea of the object. For the De Lagunas, on the other hand, the percept is the represent, representation of the concept in the external environment. So it's our actual sense impression, your sensory response to the object in the environment, while the idea is our internal representation of the concept, which James just called the concept. Uh, so the object we experience externally or internally, the, con the objects, sorry, the objects that we ex experience either internally or externally are concepts built up by our history of learning how to perce perceive and react to the world. I didn't talk so much about their theory of development. Um, Grace de Laguna gets into this in a lot of detail in her later writings. Um, not so much, not so much in dogmatism and evolution. Um, so in this ways, I think their theory, in, in the details, I think their theory gets a little uh, closer to Peirce's than to James. It kind of like twists James into our transitions, James in more of a Percian direction. Um, but like James, I think they do emphasize the import or the function of concepts most. Yeah. So they don't. Yeah, they, uh, they don't say as much still about content. They do say more about it than James, but they are really more, I think, concerned with the function or import. But I think uh, they would say meaning is both, both content and import. At least that's kind of implied in, how, in their critique of uh, how pragmatists have used the word meaning I think they want to say it's probably both, both import and function. They're not quite happy with just with saying that the meaning of an object is just its function. But the really important thing still is how concepts control behavior. This is going to be a big theme in De, uh, Grace's book on speech. Uh, yeah. So that's all about the Laguna Lagunas for today. Hopefully that's in, uh, interesting and useful. I think it's uh, an important advance. Next, we're going to go kind of back in time a little bit to talk about Josiah Royce. He's also not super well known, but he said some interesting things about meaning. Uh, he's a very different kind of uh, pragmatist. Um, he's much more of an idealist. So <clears throat> not all that he wrote a lot, so not all that he wrote about meaning is going to be uh, very useful to us, although at least not useful to this, uh, the topic of these lectures. But there are some things that he uh, wrote that are. So he's an interesting figure in terms of this uh, whole series of lectures. But anyway, so yeah, Josiah Royce is up for us next. And that is all for today. Hope you are well. Bye for now.